Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father, from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The word of God that we'd like to consider for our sermon is Genesis chapter 22, verses 1 through 18. We read that previously as our first lesson. Dear friends in Christ Jesus, our Lord and our Savior, the drama is so intense, it could be a Hollywood blockbuster. But I hope they don't make it into a movie because they just ruin it like they did the Noah and Exodus movies. But look at the life of Abram, Abraham. The Lord came to Abram out of the blue and said, pack everything up and just move. Go to a different area and stop when I tell you to stop. And then the Lord gave him a promise that even though his wife couldn't have any children, his descendants would be as numerous as the stars in the sky above. Abram simply believed and obeyed. He packed up and he set out. Incredible. By the time he was 86, though, he and his wife Sarah became a little impatient. Their age, their old age, and Sarah being Aaron was a little bit too much for them. Where was this son God had promised? So they decided to concoct their own plan to bring that promise to fruition. Abram had a son named Ishmael with a servant named Hagar. But this wasn't the way God's plan was going to be carried out, God's promise. What distrust they showed in God. And yet God was gracious and merciful to them. Thirteen years later, he came and reaffirmed his promises to Abram and Sarai, changing their names to Abraham and Sarah, reflecting that they'd be the parents of many. And one of their descendants would be the savior of the world. A year later, Abraham was 100 years old, Sarah 90 years old, and they had a son, and they named him Isaac. God had kept his promise, and through this son would come the Savior of the world. But then, the drama really heats up. Perhaps 8 to 12 years later, God comes to Abraham again, this time with a test, another test. Packing up and moving to a different country, just wherever God sent them, wasn't enough. All those promises of blessing weren't enough. No, God had another test, a bigger test, and it was a doozy. You heard about it in the first lesson. God said to Abraham, Take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains I will tell you about. God didn't come to Abraham and just say, you're going to lose your son. No, God piled up the test with layer upon layer of emotional challenges. Take your son, your only son. The one your wife couldn't have. The miracle child you now have, you waited for so long, born in your old age. Take that son and sacrifice him as a burnt offering. In other words, kill him for me. Each phrase must have felt like a dagger, digging deeper into his heart. And speaking of daggers, here God asked Abram to do something completely unusual and abnormal. Oh, the sacrificing part was normal, not the human part. God never demanded human sacrifices. But here, that's what he told Abraham to do. And to his own son, no less. What would you have done if you were Abraham? How shocking would this have been for you? Would you have asked God, why are you asking this of me? How could you ask me to kill my own son who I waited so long for? How am I going to have any descendants like you promised if my son is dead? Have I done something to make you mad? Are you punishing me by demanding this of me? How long would you have mulled over 
this in your mind, whether to listen to the Lord or listen to your heart. Look at Abraham. The very next morning, he saddled up and set out with Isaac. Now, if you're watching this as a movie, this is where the heart would start racing and the tears start flowing. As you watch Abraham and Isaac and the two servants make that three-day journey, with every single step of the way, Abraham knowing what he's being asked to do, the heart going out to him. They stop at the mountain, and Abraham says to the servants, stay here, we'll be right back. He doesn't say, I'll be right back. He says, we'll be right back. He picks up the wood, puts it on his son Isaac. He picks up the knife and the fire. And together they set out to go to the place where God told them to sacrifice his son. And just like Abraham, we, the audience, know what's about to happen. And then listen to the gut-wrenching dialogue. Little Isaac speaks, Father, oh no, you know what's going to come. Just like Abraham probably knew what was coming. The fire and wood are here, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? How could any father look their son in the eyes at this point? Abraham must have been sick to the stomach, choking back tears, trembling every step of the way. It must have taken every ounce of his strength to answer. God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. Then they reached the place for the sacrifice. Now, if this was a movie, this is the place where the music would get so intense. Abram must have felt like he was in some surreal nightmare at this point. He ties up his son. How did that go? Did Isaac squirm? Did he fight back? Did he cry out, Daddy, Daddy, what are you doing? How can you do this to me? And by the time Abraham places him on top of the wood on that altar, Isaac must have figured out what was going to happen. He must have been weeping. What was Abraham feeling at that point? Abraham looked at his beloved son, picked up the knife in his hand, raised it in the air, and was about to plunge it with a deadly blow into his son when God stopped him. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Then God provided a ram to take Isaac's place, and the Lord reaffirmed all his promises to Abraham. What an incredible story. No wonder we call Abraham a hero of faith. But could you have done what Abraham did? Could you have been a hero of faith like Abraham? Would you have gone as far as Abraham to actually take the knife in your hand, ready to plunge it into your own son? Or would you have questioned God from the beginning, argued with him, fought with him, told him, I'm not going to do this? None of us have faced a test like that in our lives. But that doesn't mean we haven't been tested in extraordinary ways. We have. Some of us have been raised in broken families. Some have lost parents, siblings, children, spouses to death way too early. Some in church have battled cancer. Some have lost their jobs or are looking for jobs. All of us at one time or another have felt the squeeze when money was tight? Just the mention of the phrase, test of faith, brings to the mind of every one of us here some difficult situation we went through in life that was a struggle, a complete struggle. All of us have been tested by the Lord multiple times. Have you always been a hero of faith in those tests? 
I haven't. I haven't always been a hero of faith when the test came my way. Oftentimes, I was a zero of faith. I doubted. I questioned. I faltered. I didn't look to God for the answer to the problem, but rather just to myself. I took my focus off of God. I did things that showed weakness and fear and worry. And I dare say you probably did too. Because at times we can be such weak Christians. And even though the Lord says you have no reason to worry, we sinfully worry. Lent is a time of reflection. A time of looking again to Jesus, our Savior. We saw him in our gospel reading. Out there in the desert undergoing an extraordinary testing. There he was in the desert, fasting for 40 days and praying. After the 40 days, he would have been hungry and weak and perhaps dehydrated. Any normal person would be at their weakest psychological moment at that point, and that's when Satan came with some terribly challenging temptations to Jesus. But Jesus never faltered. He never failed. Never gave an inch. Jesus re perfectly resisted the temptation, perfectly passed the test. And that's what Jesus came to do, to defeat Satan. He came to withstand every temptation and resist every sin. He came to defeat and totally crush Satan at the cross. And he did that for you. Jesus is like that ram in that Abraham account. God sent that ram to be a substitute for Isaac to be sacrificed in his place. Well, that's what God did with his own son. He sent Jesus into this world to be your substitute, to be sacrificed in your place. And so now his perfect life is your perfect life. His payment for sin is your payment for sin. His victory over Satan is your victory over Satan. Look back at Abraham. I want to show you a couple examples of his great faith, why we call him a hero of faith. Look again at verse 5. When Abraham led the servants and his son to the mountain, he told them to stop there. He said, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship, and then we will come back to you. Abraham knew what he was supposed to do. Take his son up into the mountain and offer him as a burnt offering. That means slay him. And yet he was confident that both of them would come back. Or look again at verse 8, where that heart-wrenching question was asked by, by Isaac. And Abraham responds, God himself will provide the lamb. Abraham was fully and completely confident that God would provide a solution in this case. How could he show such faith and trust? We're given the answer in Hebrews chapter 11, the heroes of faith chapter of the Bible. There we're told, by faith Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had embraced the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son, even though God had said to him, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. Abraham reasoned that God could even raise the dead, and so in a manner of speaking, he did receive Isaac back from death. How could he be such a hero of faith? How could he show such faith and trust in the Lord? The answer is given there. He embraced God's promises. God had promised that he and Sarah, in their old age, and even though Sarah couldn't have any children, would have a son, and he did. God had promised that through that son, he'd have descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky. God had promised that through that son's lineage, the Savior of the world had come. And Abraham knew that God could not and would not break a promise. And since God could not and would not break a promise, he reasoned that 
if you went up and did what God said and sacrificed his son as a burnt offering, God would raise him from the dead and both of them would come back down. What great faith and trust. But it's not that Abraham was such a great person and that's why he's a hero of faith. He's a sinner like you and me. Look what he and Sarai did trying to get that son committing adultery with Hagar. He's a sinner just like we are. Abraham was a hero of faith because of the one in whom he put his faith. God's the one who has the almighty power. God's the one who gives all those glorious and wondrous promises. Abraham simply believed them. He embraced them. We may think, I could never have the faith and trust like Abraham had. But it's not really about you. It's about God and his promises. That's the key to being a hero of faith. Knowing that we don't make ourselves heroes of faith, God does. Plenty of tests are going to come your way in life. Sickness, disease, cancer, death, sadness, pain, struggles in life, money problems. Who knows what those tests are going to be, but they're going to be there. That's what this sin-changed world has caused. How are you going to deal with them? Same way Abraham did. Embrace God's promises. God has promised that whoever believes in his one and only Son shall not perish but have eternal life. God has promised never to leave nor forsake you. God has promised to hear and answer all your prayers. God has promised to work everything for your good. God has promised that no one can snatch you from his hand. And God cannot and will not break a promise. So come trial or trouble, temptation or test, Be a hero of faith. Be like Abraham. Embrace God's promises. And see how the Lord carries you through everything. You can be a hero of faith. God makes you that. Amen.